Welcome to today's webinar. Today we are talking about volunteers and the law in British Columbia. We've got an amazing guest speaker, Mary Childs. I'll be introducing her more formally in just a few minutes. My name is Paula Price. I'm with the People's Law School and I will be your host and moderator today. Now, if you have questions about the law, as it relates to volunteers in British Columbia, you are in the right place. Today, what you can expect to learn about are your rights and responsibilities as a volunteer, the rights and responsibilities of organizations that work with volunteers, and steps to take to avoid problems and deal with problems when they occur. Our webinar will be 60 minutes. We will be providing answers to common questions, what you can expect is legal information, not advice. So it, legal advice would be the law as it applies to your unique set of circumstances. And if that's what you're seeking, then we encourage you to reach out to a lawyer. You'll find options for free and low cost legal help at the link provided on this slide. You will also find this link on our website as well as we will link to it with the recording of this webinar. Of course, today's information is current as of today's date. The People's Law School team would like to express that we are grateful to work on the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations whose peoples continue to live on and care for these lands. And we invite everybody who has joined us today to reflect upon where it is that they are joining us from. We would also like to thank our funders, the Department of Justice Canada, the Law Foundation of British Columbia, and the Notary Foundation of BC, whose funding makes production of our webinars possible. And finally, we would love to thank and welcome our speaker today, Mary Childs. Mary Childs is a lawyer. She is currently general counsel with the Sawasan First Nation. She previously practiced with a national law firm working primarily with charities, cooperatives, and other purpose-driven organizations. Mary chairs the Board of Governors of the Law Foundation of British Columbia. She is a member of BC's Passenger Transportation Board, and she chairs the Motor Dealer Customer Compensation Fund Board. In addition, Mary has held academic positions in law faculties both in Canada and in the UK. So we are absolutely thrilled to have Mary here with us today. Welcome, Mary. Thank you very much for that introduction. And I'm delighted to be here. It's great to see that so many people are attending from all over the province. Um, I think this is a topic that uh, is of very broad interest because so many Canadians are volunteers. Um, according to Imagine Canada, which is uh, an organization that uh, provides a lot of support and uh, advocacy for not-for-profits, there are approximately 13 million volunteers in Canada, and they give close to 2 billion hours of uh, volunteer time each year. And apart from, in addition to those volunteers, the not-for-profit sector in Canada employs something like two and a half million staff. So it's a really large part of uh, Canadian society and uh, the Canadian economy. And so it's important to all of us to think about this. And I'm very happy to be uh, discussing this topic today. Incredible. Thank you so much, Mary. And thank you for those stats. The concept of 2 billion volunteer hours annually is it's incredible. So Thank you for sharing that. Um, we are going to dive in with our first question, which is how does the law define volunteering and why does it matter? Okay. Um, it's interesting because in the law of British Columbia, volunteering is sort of defined by what it is not. Um, being a volunteer is not being an employee. So broadly speaking, a volunteer is a person who gives their services without in exchange the promise of being paid or either receiving goods or services in exchange. And generally they are donating their time and services to a charitable or not-for-profit organization. Um, and that is a very important distinction. Uh, the reason that we are concerned about, or a very important 
point that they're uh, donating to not-for-profits. Generally speaking, uh, the law will not commonly regard somebody as a volunteer if they are doing work for a for-profit organization. And I'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, but not-for-profits are the principal place where people volunteer their time. More than half of all nonprofits in Canada have no paid staff at all. It's all run by volunteers. And even the volunteer-led and volunteer-run organizations um, sometimes hire people, external consultants for specialized tasks, but a lot of them function entirely on volunteer labor. And as we know, of course, there are also some larger charities and not-for-profits where there are paid staff and volunteers working alongside them or um, in conjunction with them. So the law between volunteers and employees isn't always clear. Um, you may have several people working on a project or program for a not-for-profit, and some of them are volunteers and some are, are employees. And the distinction between the two is really important. It's important because uh, the employment law protections that apply to uh, workers don't apply to volunteers. So uh, rules about um, scheduling, notice, vacations, a whole range of things that are in place under the Employment Standards Act or workers' compensation legislation apply only to people who fall within the definition of an employee. Uh, so if you are a volunteer, uh, you need to be aware of that. And probably from a kind of risk management point of view, the most important thing to note is that if you are a volunteer, you're not covered by WorkSafe BC coverage if there's some kind of injury in the context of the volunteering work that you do. Um, now, Employment Standards Act, which applies to workers, is designed to protect them as broadly as possible. And so its provisions have been interpreted quite broadly to protect the widest possible group of individuals. And so the definition of employee under the Employment Standards Act um, has been interpreted sometimes to apply to people who uh, had thought or the organization working with them and thought were volunteers. And so uh, I just want to mention there are a few factors that the Employment Standards Tribunal has applied when determining whether an individual should be considered a volunteer or an employee. So whether the individual expected compensation, and it doesn't have to be money. It could be things like having meals provided, having merchandise provided, event tickets, a whole range of things. Um, whether the employer was directing the individual to engage in specific tasks, whether the employer directed the individual to come to work, required them to be there at specific times, um, and, you know, as I said, particularly whether the individual got any form of compensation. So uh, there have been situations where people who receive meals or um, event tickets or merchandise were considered to to be an employee for the purposes of employment law rather than um, volunteers. And that can have some pretty dramatic consequences for the organization because uh, they might be asked to pay minimum wage or to comply with other aspects of employment standards. Uh, and this is the reason why, uh, or one of the reasons why generally somebody who's doing un doing tasks for a for-profit entity will not be considered to be a volunteer because um, they're doing something um, where there's ordinarily an expectation of pay. But it's a difficult issue for not-for-profits. Everybody's dealing with some tight financial constraints, and there may be financial pressures to have volunteers do work that staff might otherwise do. You know, if you're uh, somebody who's helping with admin tasks in the office quits and you have a vacancy and a volunteer is willing to do it. Um, that can be very helpful from the financial point of view, but you need to be careful to make sure that that person wouldn't be regarded in law as an employee. 
There's a lot more information available through various sources if you want to think about the distinction between volunteers and employees. Uh, Volunteer Canada is a great organization that has some information on its website. And there's also guidance provided by WorkSafe BC and the Employment Standards Branch about the distinctions between volunteers and employees. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mary. And we can provide links to those websites along with the recording of today's webinar. Um, our next question is, what are some of the factors that a person should consider before volunteering? What types of questions should a volunteer ask an organization before they volunteer? Um, well, this is a very good question, and it's something everybody should think about. Uh, because there are so many different kinds of volunteer positions out there from sitting on boards to, uh, you know, helping out um, with environmental cleanups or, uh, you know, things can be very, uh, at very different levels of physical demand, mental demand, different time constraints. So I would say the most important questions to ask are those that help you determine whether this particular position is a good fit for you and what your expectations should be before you commit yourself. So the first obvious question is what kind of level of commitment is expected? Are you being asked to attend a meeting once a month for a couple of hours? Are you being asked to give a day a week of your time? Um, is it you know, what sort of commitment level is re is required? Are you expected to agree that you're going to continue doing this for uh, the next two years? Is it just helping out for a few weeks? So think about what those expectations are. As with so many things in life, uh, the important thing is to make sure that both parties to this organization, to this arrangement, the volunteer and the organization have the same basic understanding of what the expectations are. So before you consider, think about um, what the organization is going to do. If you're thinking about volunteering with a specific organization, um, you may think it's a great organization. Think about what, uh, what they do generally. What are the uh, programs and services that they provide? There may be um, more than one volunteer position and think about which one is right for you. Think about your own qualifications and how, and your interests and how you would like to use those for the benefit of the organization when, that you're volunteering for. Um, you know, every organization, uh, it seems, would be very happy, for example, to have an accountant on their board of directors. Um, which is a volunteer position generally. And so if you're an accountant, you'll never find a shortage of positions where your financial expertise can be put to use. Uh, but maybe uh, maybe you're an accountant who would really rather help uh, with a volunteer gardening project, you know. So think not just about what skills you have to offer, but also what really interests you. Um, think about the kind of the working conditions or the conditions you're going to be in when you're volunteering. Uh, does it require, uh, you know, sort of physically demanding volunteer work? Is it going to be uh, something that is indoors, outdoors? Think about how what those kind of conditions are. Are you going to be uh, with large groups of people or volunteering on your own? And very importantly, from the legal point of view, what are the risks and responsibilities of the position? Because um, like every kind of human activity, there are risks attached to volunteering. And there are also important responsibilities. We're going to talk about them a little bit more in this webinar. Um, so when you agree to volunteer, you are also um, taking on potentially some legal responsibilities in that context. So it's not something that should scare you, but you should be aware of it and think about it before you uh, rush into the volunteering position. Another good question to ask the organization is what kind of training and support they can provide to you to make sure that you have the skills uh, to succeed in the volunteer position. And uh, just revisiting that issue of risk, uh, it's important to think 
and ask the organization, for example, do they have insurance to protect their volunteers? I just mentioned that volunteers are not covered by WorkSafe BC generally because they're not employees. There are some situations where a not-for-profit can arrange special WorkSafe coverage for volunteers, but that needs to be arranged before any problems arise. So if you're concerned about that, if it's a volunteer position where you think there might be some risk of an injury or accident, check and see what kind of insurance coverage they have in case any problems arise. Super. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, moving on to our next question. I helped a local charity with a fundraiser and some money went missing. Can I be held responsible for the missing money? Well, uh, as with many legal questions, the answer is it depends. Um, and it depends on all the circumstances. Uh, if, for example, as a volunteer, you're the person who had responsibility for keeping the money safe, you agreed to do that, and that was the expectation, and you did not take reasonable care to keep it safe and secure, then you could be found to be negligent. Um, and negligence is the basis of a lot of legal liability. It's the same principle that creates liability for motor vehicle accidents or uh, medical malpractice, a whole range of things. It's where you don't intend to do something wrongful, but uh, what you did falls below the standard of care that's expected of a reasonable person in those circumstances. So if you did everything that a reasonable person could be expected to do to make sure that the money was secure, but despite your efforts, something happened, somebody broke in and stole something, then maybe you won't be liable. Um, but if you left the money unattended in a place where it could easily be stolen, then uh, there's a good chance that you could be responsible. So the fact that you are not paid to do the work has no effect on your liability in this situation. Um, you are responsible if what you did was not enough to uh, live up to the standard that we would expect of an ordinary person in those circumstances. It doesn't mean that you have to be perfect. Um, it just means that you have to take reasonable care. So if you did everything that could reasonably be expected of you and some thief stole the money anyway, despite your reasonable efforts, then you may not be liable. So it's uh, very much dependent on the circumstances. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Mary. And, and, I, and I think one of the things you're addressing here is just this idea that volunteers may not be liable because they're not being paid. But in fact, it really is a liability based on, as you described, the, the standard of care, the what would a reasonable person in that situation be expected to do? Yeah. Amazing. You don't have to be paid to be liable, just in the same way as, you know, people driving down the street who drive carelessly and cause an accident are not being paid by the person who has to be compensated. Um, it's a question of whether you fulfilled the duties that you agreed to take on. So as I said, when you agree to be the per if you agree to be the person taking care of the money, then you agree to live up to the responsibilities of that role, even if you're not paid to do it. Excellent, thank you. And this next example, my daughter's daycare needs volunteer drivers for a field trip. What types of risks would you be taking on? Yeah, well, here's an example of uh, a situation where your responsibilities might actually be above and beyond those of the average person in the situation. For the most part, the law just expects you to take the same care as an average reasonable person. Where you are responsible for children, anytime you're responsible for young people, um, you are going to be held to a higher standard. And instead of the standard being that that we expect of a reasonable average person, you will be expected generally to live up to the standard of a reasonable parent or guardian. You are uh, effectively um, in the place of the guardian, uh, and the law uh, expects you to take active steps to help the children, to supervise them, to prevent them getting lost or hurt. Um, you know, if you were driving a bunch of adults uh, on a field trip somewhere, then you're not responsible for 
making sure that they don't get lost or trip over their shoelaces or anything like that as a general rule. But if you are uh, supervising or driving the kids, you will have a higher degree of responsibility. So you would need to think about, do you have, for example, if you're, does the vehicle that you're driving have all of the appropriate safety equipment? Do they, should they have car seats? Do you have the right number of seat belts? Um, you have the responsibility of any driver to the passengers in your car. Um, so if it's your vehicle, you need to make sure that you have uh, appropriate insurance coverage. And uh, generally, you need to make sure, um, hopefully, as the driver, you're not the person responsible for supervising all the kids. The daycare staff will do that, but um, it's your responsibility to make sure that when you drive the kids there, um, you don't just let them out of the vehicle and assume, for example, that they're going to run over to the daycare staff. You have to keep custody of them and look after them until uh, the responsible daycare person is there to effectively take them under their supervision. Super. Thank you so much. Um, this next question is how you can protect yourself as a volunteer. Well, um, there are a number of things that you can do to protect yourself as a volunteer. And uh, I want to emphasize in all of this discussion that, you know, when I'm talking about the risks, there are risks to being a volunteer and taking on these responsibilities, but everything in life has risks. And there are also very great rewards to volunteering um, in terms of uh, the benefit that you confer on society and the benefits that you will receive from volunteering. So to protect yourself, um, the if you have the opportunity to get some legal advice, that's great. Uh, most people don't go out and get legal advice before they take on some volunteer activities. But again, it's going to depend what it is that you are doing. Um, it's important to uh, think about the protection that the organization has. Um, what kind of risk management practices do they have? Larger organizations often have, you know, their own risk management policies and procedures. Um, again, ask about their insurance or think about the insurance um, and consider whether uh, if the organization doesn't have much in the way of insurance, uh, consider whether your insurance will protect you if there's any problems, because sometimes your own insurance will provide you with protection. And uh, make sure you have adequate information all the time. We talked earlier about the idea of uh, communicating with the organization and figuring out what are the responsibilities of the volunteer position that you're going to take on. Uh, making sure that you have uh, the appropriate training, uh, making sure that uh, if there's any safety equipment that the organization is providing it. And uh, very importantly, in any situation, if you have concerns about any risks, speak up. Really important to raise any concerns you have uh, about safety, for example. Um, it may be helpful to have, you know, written records of what's expected of you so that you know exactly what obligations you're taking on. And if there are some obligations you don't want to take on, um, make that clear. And generally, you know, keep yourself informed. Uh, make sure you're aware of what's going on in the organization. Talk to people, ask questions. Thank you. These are really, really excellent suggestions. <clears throat> Mary, here's another scenario. I want to join a nonprofit as a director. What kind of responsibilities can I expect to have in that role? And what should I look out for before agreeing to do this? Um, this is a very important question. As a director uh, of the organization, you're responsible for kind of running it, setting policy, and you have a number of legal responsibilities. Uh, there are two basic responsibilities of directors. 
Um, one is what's commonly referred to as the duty of care, and that's similar to the idea of uh, negligence, the idea I talked about before, that you have to take the care and uh, attention and put in the work that would be expected of a reasonable person in this situation. So before you go to meetings, you should read all the materials that you are expected to read. You should uh, be expected to show up for meetings. You should pay attention. You should ask questions. Uh, so all of those things are really important in fulfilling your responsibilities as a director. Taking appropriate care to make sure that you do the job properly. Don't, you know, and if you can't do that, uh, don't take it on. You shouldn't, you need to make sure that you attend meetings regularly, you read the materials, you pay attention, you ask questions. And there's also another type of legal responsibility that directors have, and this is what's called a fiduciary responsibility. And a fiduciary responsibility is a kind of responsibility that the law imposes on people in a whole range of situations where they're required to show a particular loyalty and care towards the organization. So basically, uh, you need, in everything you do as a director, you need to act um, honestly and with a view to the best interests of the organization. Um, and where that's particularly significant is if there's ever a situation where the interests of the organization conflict with your own. So you need to think about conflict of interest issues. Um, and the Societies Act, which is the act that most commonly regulates not-for-profits in British Columbia, has a lot of rules about um, conflict of interest. Generally speaking, uh, in all situations, if you think that, let's say, the, uh, the not-for-profit might want to uh, buy some goods from a business that you own or you have shares in, uh, your interest as the owner of the business is to get the highest possible price. The interest of the organization is to pay the lowest possible price. And therefore, those two duties or interests that you have conflict. It doesn't mean that you can't be on a board if there's a potential conflict, but your obligation generally is to disclose that to the board, step aside from the discussion, don't take part in the discussion, and don't vote on anything that uh, might put you in a conflict of interest. And there's a lot of information out there about conflict of interest issues and how organizations can deal with them, but you need to always be thinking because the board mm -hmm. and the organization might not be aware that there's a conflict until you disclose it, and it's your obligation to disclose that. There are some legal responsibilities that directors have in particular circumstances. So uh, sometimes if directors vote to pay out assets of the organization improperly, um, or illegally, they may have some personal responsibility for those payments, and they may have some legal responsibility for, uh, in some situations, for unpaid wages or um, tax that should be should have been deducted and, and paid to Revenue Canada if the organization has employees. So, where do you look to find out what your responsibilities are? Well. First and foremost, look at the constitution and bylaws of the organization to find out what it says about directors' responsibilities. That's quite important. Um, look at any policies and procedures they might have. And uh, you should also take a look at the legislation that applies to the organization. Um, as I said, most not-for-profits in British Columbia are incorporated under an act called the Society Act. And if you look at that, you will find a lot of information about the legal responsibilities of directors and the responsibilities of the organization generally. There are sometimes not-for-profits that are incorporated under the equivalent federal legislation, the Not-for-Profit Corporations Act, but this is much less common in British Columbia. There may be some specialized legislation that applies to the organization's activities. For example, if your not-for-profit uh, runs a daycare, 
that's an area of activity that's quite highly regulated and you might want to get some information about what responsibilities uh, the organization or its directors might have under that legislation. So a lot of information that you might want to figure out, and uh, I'm going to suggest a good place to look for that information. You can find some information, of course, always on the People's Law School website, but there's also a website in British Columbia called Law for Nonprofits, and Law for Nonprofits has a lot of information uh, for directors and officers of British Columbia societies about where to look for information about the organization, what legal duties they might have, how to uh, deal with common legal issues. And that's a very good place to look for some information. Excellent. And there's, there's a great deal of information out there from other organizations that work for not-for-profits and volunteers, but that one particularly is quite up to date and it's in very uh, accessible language. It's written in plain English and not legalese and it's very user friendly. It will help you produce checklists and give you guidance documents. Wonderful. And we'll provide links as mentioned before to these really helpful resources that you're referring us to. Thank you. Um, here's another example. What happens if you're elected to your strata council for a one year term and you find that it becomes too much, are you able to quit before your year is up? Yes, and if it's too much for you, uh, not only can you leave, uh, but you should. Um, it's not any good for you or the organization to have you on the strata council if it turns out to be a commitment that is too much for any reason. And, uh, you should step down. You can't be compelled to stay for the full year. Um, you should probably look at the strata bylaws to see if there are any particular requirements about how you resign, whether you have to do so in writing and all of those procedural matters. Um, and generally speaking, well, I think every strata's bylaws will have provisions in there that contemplate this kind of situation and allow the council to fill the vacancy. So um, they may well be able to find somebody else who can fill your position um, who doesn't have the same capacity constraints. Super, thank you so much, Mary. Uh, this next question is, a committee at my daughter's school is organizing a fair. Volunteer parents will help with face painting, popcorn making, ticket sales, and running a dunk tank. What responsibilities does the committee have to the volunteers? Well, um, the committee should uh, first and foremost think about safety, make sure that uh, there's reasonable care taken to ensure that the volunteers and everyone at the fair are safe. Um, so, uh, you know, make sure the dunk tank is not dangerous. Uh, make sure that everybody has kind of clear understanding about what they're supposed to be doing. And there's a good or system of organization. So people know, but to get back to our previous example, if somebody's selling the tickets, uh, you want to make sure that everybody understands who's going to be in charge of the money and uh, reduce the risk of problems arising. Uh, and there's also, uh, for volunteers as well as employees, there are requirements uh, that under human rights legislation, uh, you not uh, discriminate against anybody on a protected ground. So make sure that, uh, say, for example, if you have volunteers with disabilities, you try to accommodate those as much as possible and make sure that uh, you do whatever is reasonably possible to support their participation. Um, and you also, you know, should make sure that generally everybody feels comfortable and safe and has a good understanding of what their expectations are. Thank you, Mary. Um, this next question is, I volunteer for a not, sorry, a nonprofit organization that runs an annual festival. Um, one of the volunteers led a friend into the festival against the rules. The friend fell and injured herself while dancing at a concert. If the friend starts a lawsuit, 
would the organization be responsible for compensating her for her injuries? And yet again, the answer is it depends. <laughs> and uh, the first thing I would say is that the fact that it was against the rules for the volunteer to let the friend into the festival doesn't affect the legal position. Um, she's that friend um, is in no different a legal position than if uh, she had bought a ticket to the music festival. Um, the question is really whether uh, there's any fault on the part of the organization uh, that led to the injury. So uh, generally speaking, let's say the, uh, the dance floor was slippery and not enough steps were being taken to make sure that spilled drinks were wiped up or um, something like that. And that caused the accident. Uh, was the dance floor too crowded and nobody was paying proper attention to the crowds and capacity of the event? Those are the kind of things that could lead to legal liability on the part of the organization if they didn't take reasonable care to make sure that it was a safe environment for everybody attending it. Um, you know, it's reasonably foreseeable if you run this kind of event that, you know, people are going to dance at the concert and uh, you can't take steps to prevent everybody falling down, but you can make the, uh, the situation as safe as reasonably possible. So did they trip because there was an electrical cord running across the dance floor that people hadn't properly uh, secured. Well, in that case, it might be the legal responsibility of the organization. But if uh, the friend is just a particularly exuberant dancer and uh, a little bit clumsy and tripped over her own shoelaces, probably not the responsibility of the organization. It's going to depend very much on the facts in each case. Um, and it may be that there is a bit of both. Um, liability, responsibility for accidents isn't uh, you know, a black and white situation. It isn't entire, it may be partially the responsibility of the organization, partially the responsibility of the person dancing. Uh, everybody has is expected to take reasonable care of themselves. Um, so if she was careless and the organization was careless, there might be uh, some kind of split of responsibility. Thank you, Mary. Uh this next question is, I run a small not nonprofit that relies on volunteers on a regular basis. We like to keep things simple. Do we need to have a policy in place for our volunteers? Well, um, here I won't say it depends. I will say yes. Yes, you should have a policy and it doesn't matter that, uh, you know, you want to keep things simple. You don't have to have a complicated policy. It doesn't have to be hundreds of pages long. You don't have to pay uh, a lawyer thousands of dollars to create it. Um, there are a lot of examples available online and uh, there are a number of places where you can get free advice or affordable advice on what you might want to put in the policy. A policy is important because it helps both parties, the organization and the volunteer um, by setting out some clear expectations about roles and responsibilities and procedures um, it can reduce the risks of a disagreement about a whole range of things. Um, by and large, I would say in my experience, the vast majority of situations where people end up in legal disputes, it's not because uh, one person intended to behave badly, but it's often because people have different ideas about what's expected because they haven't sat down and talked it through or they don't have it written down anywhere. So it's really helpful to have policies that make it as clear as possible who's responsible for what. Um, and that reduces the risk of disputes arising um, even between people who both had the best of intentions. Uh, there are certain situations also where the law is going to require you to have policies, such as with respect to privacy. Pretty much any organization that operates in British Columbia is required to have a privacy policy if they are uh, using, collecting, um, or sharing personal information. 
So uh, for things like that, you might want to look at the Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner, which will have a lot of guidance for anybody who's thinking about what they should put in a privacy policy. Um, there are a whole number of things that you could put in your policy, and I'm just going to list a few that I think uh, would be worth thinking about. Um, one is, you know, how do you screen and select your volunteers? Uh, are you going to follow up on references? Are you going to require references? Do you need them to have particular qualifications? If they're going to be driving, are you going to check their driver's licenses? And for some kinds of volunteer positions, if they are going to be working with vulnerable populations like children or elderly people, um, you may have to have uh, certain types of criminal record checks for them, vulnerable sector checks. So anytime uh, your organization is in that kind of space, working with vulnerable populations, you need to think carefully about what your policy is with respect to the background checks. Conversely, you shouldn't be going too far in that direction because for most uh, positions, whether volunteer or paid, you don't need to have criminal record checks. Um, you should have pretty clear descriptions of the positions when somebody is volunteering, what kind of roles are you expecting them to take on? Just like when you hire someone, you want to have a job description for them. You need to have also uh, the equivalent for volunteer positions. So everybody knows when, uh, well, what the person is supposed to be doing, how you're going to measure that, what the expectations are. Uh, it's good to have a pol your policy deal with orientation and training. Uh, things like supervision and mentoring and feedback on performance. Uh, it's very important to have anti-discrimination policies and policies that deal with uh, things like harassment and bullying because you have legal obligation to protect uh, your staff and volunteers from that kind of misconduct. And you, it's very important, as I said before, that you have privacy policies and confidentiality policies. Make sure that your volunteers understand what their obligations are to keep confidential information in confidence. Excellent. Thank you, Thank you Mary. A um, couple more questions to go, and then we're going to move into the, the questions submitted by our attendees. Um, the question is this, our church runs a summer program for teens, which includes sailing lessons run by volunteers. I've been told I should look into waivers and insurance. We're on a very tight budget. What should I do? It, waivers and insurance are very important. And um, it's not something where you want to ignore it simply because you're on a tight budget. Because um, as I heard someone say recently in a meeting, if you think that the costs of legal compliance are Hi, you should think about the cost of illegal. <laughs> illegal is a lot more expensive than legal. Um, and uh, first, my first step here would be to suggest that you talk to the church about its existing insurance. Um, maybe their insurance policies cover the program. Um, maybe they need to get some extra coverage. Um, but that would be an important starting place because I imagine the church already has its own insurance. Um, and one important thing that I want to mention and explain about insurance is that uh, it's important not only because it might cover you if you are found legally liable, but typically the insurance policy will also provide you with um, legal advice and representation to help you if there is a claim. And that's where a lot of organizations find it really prohibitive, even if the, per the person sues you and you are, uh, even if you're successful, you might still run up very significant legal fees and your insurance can protect against that risk. So review, um, when it comes to waivers and releases, the People's Law School has great information on its website. I would look there. And there are also, I think, some links on the PLS website uh, to places where you can find uh, affordable, simple templates that you can get online um, fairly inexpensively that uh, will help you prepare a waiver so that anyone taking part in the sailing lessons 
uh, agrees, and the purpose of a waiver is to make sure that that person agrees that they're not going to sue you if there are any accidents that arise. And there's quite a few rules about what you need to have in a waiver and how you need to present it to the person and explain it to them. So do some reading. There's a lot of information and that's available free of cost online about waivers. And uh, there are a lot of free sources where you of advice where you can go and have somebody just quickly look it over for you. You might even be able to get some advice from the insurance company because it's in their interest also to make sure that you have effective waivers in place. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, our last question before we turn to the questions from our guests. Our not-for-profit got sued by a volunteer who got injured while volunteering. What um, steps should we take first? Well, first of all, don't panic. And uh, the first thing to do is to take a look at the document that was served on you. You probably received something like a notice of claim, and you should look at it and check the deadlines in it particularly, because often there's a fairly short period of time that you have to respond to a claim. And so you need to really make sure that you're aware of any time limits. Um, you should call your insurance company, assuming that you have insurance, because as I said, they not only may be able to help you uh, paying any compensation claim, but they might be able to get a lawyer to respond to the claim on your behalf. If you don't have, uh, well, even if you do have that coverage, make sure that you gather all of the records that you might have of the incident, get facts clear. Um, if your insurance company is not providing legal advice, uh, see if you can find some other way to get advice. Um, there's useful information on the uh, People's Law School website about what to do if you get a legal letter. And that information covers uh, and is helpful for not just this kind of claim, like a personal injury claim, but there are a whole range of situations in which your not-for-profit might find that there's some kind of legal claim being brought. Could be small claims, human rights claim, a claim about a privacy violation. And in each case, if there is a tribunal involved or other body, go and look at their website for specific information about how to respond and any deadlines that might apply. Excellent. Uh, and if you have any court forms, just one last point, they you might need help filling in. Uh, there's a pro bono organization called AC Friends of Court that will help anybody who asks, um, offers its services in different languages, and it provides assistance filling in court forms. Beautiful. And thank you so much, Mary. The, the references that you're providing as well are so helpful. So we will be linking to those along with the recording of today's webinar. Um, turning to uh, our first question, if a volunteer's role involves using their own vehicle, does their own vehicle insurance cover them or does the organization pay for increased insurance? Well, the first thing to do, I would say, again, I'm going to keep saying it depends. Depends what you're doing in the vehicle um, and depends on the coverage of your insurance policy. So if you are regularly going to be using your vehicle, say, to transport people, maybe you're a volunteer helping people get to medical appointments. Um, I would check with the insurance company, talk to your insurance broker or ICBC to make sure that your coverage is appropriate. And if you need some kind of additional coverage, then uh, it may be appropriate to talk to the organization and see if they will reimburse you for those costs. Excellent, thank you. Um, I am a 76 year old. I do a lot of volunteer work for Estrada gardening, landscaping, physical work, is there coverage if I'm injured? Is there any age restriction regarding coverage for people my age? Um, not that I know of. I mean, works if they have WorkSafe BC coverage, which they might not have if you're just volunteering, um, then that applies to workers of any age. There's not a cutoff date. Uh, and generally speaking, if it's, uh, you know, the Stratus insurance policy and every strata should have a pretty robust insurance policy, um, it will depend on the insurer. I mean, the, the strata itself wants to protect itself against liability. So I wouldn't 
expect that there is an age limit, but it's going to depend on the policy in each case. So you should ask uh, the Strata Council maybe for a copy of the insurance policy um, so that you can review it yourself. Excellent. Thank you. Um, when volunteering as a Strata Council member, is the Strata Corporation considered a nonprofit? Um, well, that's a good question. It's not a nonprofit in the ordinary sense, uh, in that it's not incorporated under the Societies Act. The law that applies to Strata Councils is the Strata Property Act. And so you wouldn't go and look at the rules about uh, societies or federally incorporated not-for-profits, but the general principles are going to be pretty much the same, like the liability of directors uh, is pretty much the same as the liability of members of the Strata Council. Um, but it's a very good point that there's a specific uh, statute that applies, uh, and that would be the place to look for the starting point of those legal rules and also the bylaws of your strata. Excellent, thank you. And I just wanted to acknowledge all the questions that have come in today. They're really excellent questions and we'll we'll have Mary look at as many as we can. We've got a few minutes left, um, but just wanted to acknowledge them, thank you. Um, this next question, can you be sued personally for serving on a volunteer board for a nonprofit? For what reasons or actions could you be held personally liable? Um, well, your liability is um, if you do something, uh, for example, that is in conflict of interest uh, and you profit by that, you will have a legal responsibility to pay those profits back to the society. Um, generally speaking, directors are not personally responsible for the acts of the not-for-profit itself, but there may be times, let's say, if you are acting fraudulently and your fraudulent behavior uh, affects the not-for-profit, you might be personally responsible. Uh, and as I said before, uh, sometimes there's personal liability for things like unpaid taxes and employment insurance. It is very important, um, you know, that you think if you're on a thinking of joining a board of an organization that has some money has some assets or where you may be responsible for considerable assets, think about whether they have directors and officers liability insurance. Um, it's unfortunately can be quite expensive, but uh, that insurance will provide legal protection for directors and officers if they are sued for anything that's said or done in their capacity as directors and officers. Um, and that's one of the questions you might want to ask about that specific type of insurance before you think about joining a board. Excellent. Thank you, Mary. Here's a question that goes back to the definition of volunteer. We have volunteers that have volunteered for more than five years. Does the number of years make them an employee or would they still sit as, vo as volunteers? A number of years does not make them an employee. Um, it's not a question of time. You can have volunteers who commit a lot of time to helping out for many years. Um, and you can also have, you know, employees who are there for a much shorter time. Uh, the real question is, are they doing something uh, for a not-for-profit that's done with the purpose of helping and without any expectation of compensation? Uh, so, for example, board members or, well, I've known people who volunteered on boards for many years, uh, and that has its advantages and disadvantages, but it's not a question of, of time, but it's a very good question. Excellent. Thank you, Mary. And there are so many amazing questions. We're not going to get to all of them. I think we probably have time for one more. Uh, and this question is, again, related to the definition of volunteers, I, I believe. The, the question is... Um, to please comment on stipends, honorariums, and other types of compensation, such as passes and tickets. Well, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, that type of compensation can, if it's significant, cause uh, an employment standards tribunal or work safe to think that somebody is a worker rather than a volunteer, that they're an employee rather than a volunteer. I mean, from a work safe point of view, it might be good for them if they have coverage, but 
would not be good for an organization that hasn't paid the appropriate premiums. Um, you know, if what you're getting is lunch provided as you're spending the day volunteering, nobody's going to think that that makes you an employee. Um, but if you're getting significant benefits in exchange for a relatively small commitment, that's a very different matter. It's unfortunately, again, the answer is almost always, it depends on the circumstances. There's no kind of bright line. Beautiful. Thank you, Mary. And I'm going to squeeze one last question in um, that's related to waivers. I think we have just a moment, but um, the question is, what should be in a waiver for volunteers? Any examples? And you mentioned before there's uh, a link in the People's Law School website, so that's another really helpful place to go. But any thoughts before we wrap up? Yes. Um, the most important thing about a waiver is that the person who is signing it is really, really clear about the fact that it is a waiver and that they are giving up their legal rights to sue you if something goes wrong. So uh, having a document that is as clearly worded as possible, you know, like if you go skiing, you'll see a uh, waiver that you have to sign and it'll be in bright information and in bright yellow with red lines around it to make sure that you don't overlook the fact that there are some serious legal consequences because uh, there are serious consequences. Uh, someone who signs an effective waiver is not going to be able to sue. So you need to make it clear. It should uh, state very clearly what the risks are. Um, if it's a waiver that just says, I agree to waive uh, any claims for any risks, that's probably not effective. But if it says the risk of this protect particular type of activity is, say, injury, uh, maybe a car accident, uh, whatever the particular risks are, the more specific it is, the greater the likelihood that a court would find that that waiver was effective. Because the whole question is, did that person really understand the seriousness of what they were uh, agreeing to when they signed the waiver? It's important that the person has some time to think about the waiver before they engage in whatever the activity it is. You don't get them to sign it in the car on the way to the activity. They need to be able to make a decision. Am I going to sign the waiver and take part in this activity? Or am I going to not sign it because I don't want to give up that protection of being able to sue? So clear and comprehensive. And struggled maybe to balance those two, but try and keep the language keep the language clear. Make sure that that person is as, as informed as they possibly can be. With that, Mary, I really wanted to thank you again. Uh, you have shared so much information today and answered all of our prepared questions and these additional questions comprehensively. And so, just wanted to thank you and ask you if there's anything that you'd like to share with our guests before we wrap up today. Um, I would like to thank the guests for their time and thank you for the really thoughtful, pertinent questions that were asked. And I would also like to express my very real gratitude to everyone in this uh, webinar who is a volunteer or supports volunteers or works with a not-for-profit organization. Um, because they are such an important part of uh, our society. And uh, I can't, uh, can't say enough about the respect and gratitude I have for volunteers. Thank you so much, Mary. And as our volunteer today, we have so much respect and gratitude for you. So thank you again for, for helping us all have a greater understanding on this area of the law. It has been such a pleasure working with you and Thank you to everybody who joined us. It really is wonderful that you've joined us here today. And uh, again, appreciate your time, appreciate your questions and very much look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you everybody.